I'm Jacob's first wife, or as I like to call it, his best wife. <laughs> Hi, darling. You're right, some people get a bit hung up on the actual wedding itself, yeah. but that's water under the bridge. Okay, so he did fall in love with my little sister and he was engaged to her for seven years. And Dad did trick him into marrying me first by disguising me as Rachel on the wedding day and forgetting to mention that he'd swapped the bride. But it was nothing to do with me. I'm the oldest. Of course I should have been married first, eh? Yeah. Yeah. Jacob and I are so compatible too. We've had so many little babies together. I feel just so fulfilled as a mother. Really is so grounding. I feel so calm and so blessed. Not like Rachel. I know Jacob still loves her instead of me, but she has no children. Yeah. God saw that I was feeling unloved and he answered my prayers for babies, but he won't answer her prayers. Makes you wonder, doesn't it? Yeah. Do you know, the other day it all came to a head. Yeah. When Rachel started yelling at Jacob, begging him to make him pregnant. Finally, my poor sweetheart had just had enough. He yelled back. Did he, she think he was God? He told her it was God's fault and not his. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> of course, I get no pleasure out of when they fight. I'm no schadenfreude girl. Yeah. But for once, it's nice to see that husband thief of a sister getting exactly what she wants or what she deserves. Yeah. Yeah. God has blessed me, and I'm sure that if I have just one more baby, then Jacob is finally going to wake up and discover that it's me he's loved all along. Well, kia ora, Shaw Community Church. Great to be back with you again as we continue this fun series, our wandering, looking at the life of Jacob in the book of Genesis in the Old Testament. And it's such a joy to be part of this collective, isn't it? With you guys and with our church, Grace City, and, and now with Life Church in Manurewa as well. And I hope you've enjoyed the series so far. We're at the midpoint, and today we pick up exactly where Reuben left off last week with this kind of messy situation. And I wonder if you've uh, realized yet in this story just how messy and broken everyone is. This is not one of those wonderful stories where you look for someone who's a hero of the faith or a, a heroine of trusting God, and you go, I want to I follow their example. I want to I map my, my life on, on, on theirs. Rather, this is a story, isn't it, of messiness and brokenness and sin. And it's not just Jacob, by the way. It is certainly Jacob. But it's also his dad, Isaac, and his mum, Rebecca, and his brother, Esau, and his uncle, Laban. It's everyone in this story. And the great news today, as we continue this series, is that it's going to get worse. It's going to get even more messy than you would have thought possible. And so we're going to pick up right where Reuben left off. So, of course, Jacob has got married to these two sisters, and I don't know if he emphasized it here last week, but Reuben certainly did at Grace City the week before. Before we get all excited about the romance between Jacob and, and, and Rachel, and he loved her enough that he served seven years, and it was just a few days, and we're all going, ooh, isn't that gorgeous? And it's like, they're cousins, friends. They're cousins. But he falls in love with Rachel. He works for her for seven years because he's penniless, he has no money, so that's how he pays the dowry, the bride price to Uncle Laban. But on the wedding night at the end of that seven years, what happens is that Uncle Laban out Jacob's Jacob. He deceives the deceiver, he does a switcheroo, and in the darkness of the tent, the darkness of nightfall, probably she would have been veiled as the bride. He switches out beautiful Rachel and puts in the older sister Leah, and, um, and so the wedding is consummated, the wedding is completed, in the morning Jacob wakes up with a big grin on his face and a little bit of sunlight's filtering through the tent of the, the flap of the tent, and he rolls over, ah, it's Leah! And he goes to his uncle and says, what have you done? And he explains that the custom is they don't marry off the younger sister before the older one, and he's like, you had seven years to tell me that. 
And so he says, tell you what, there's the whole week of celebrations, because a wedding lasts seven days back then. Let's, let's have the week celebration. And then you can marry Rachel as well and work another seven years, to which Jacob agrees. And what you have is this incredibly messy situation now where Jacob has married these two women. That's what these chairs represent on the stage today. So we have Leah over here. We have Rachel over here. I was going to ask for a couple of women to volunteer to come and sit in the chairs and be Leah and Rachel, but trust me, you don't want to be Leah and Rachel today. So we're not going to do volunteers. We're just going to use the chairs to symbolize these two women. But this is a messy, messy marriage that's about to get even messier because what's going to happen, the story we're going to um, follow through today as we pick up right from where Reuben left off is we're going to watch the birth of the children that Jacob will have. And what happens is it becomes this horrendous competition between those, these two women. And so as you go through different commentaries and, and listen to scholars on the story, here's how some of them described it. One of them called it the birth wars. Another one called it the baby wars. Another one describes this as a biblical soap opera. One of them describes this as a miserable game of rivalry and someone else nicknamed it the battle of wills and wombs. However you look at it, it is a complete mess. I mean, to begin with, Jacob is married to two sisters. I mean, it feels like we're looking at a Mormon family in the back blocks of Utah, doesn't it? <laughs> Jacob and his sister brides. And we have this, the messiness of polygamy. And while the Bible will often report polygamy because it was very common practice in the ancient world, and sadly, many figures of faith through the narrative of the Bible will have polygamous marriages, it never condones it. But just because Scripture is reporting that this is the situation, Jacob, this figure of faith, marries these two sisters, doesn't mean that God approves of that. In fact, every time you read of a polygamous marriage in the Bible, it is described in a negative way, as though the writers of Scripture are deliberately undermining this common practice. And when you go back to Genesis chapter 2, uh, at the beginning in the Garden of Eden before sin enters the world, we find that is where the norm of marriage is, one man married to one woman, that's the way God created it. So you have this, this messy situation that we're starting the story and the messiness of polygamy. But within the messiness of polygamy, we also have the messiness of favoritism. And now you would have thought Jacob growing up in the home he grew up in where dad loved one of the brothers and mum loved the other one and they played favorites through the years, you would have thought that Jacob would have cottoned on. This is not a good way to do marriage and parenting. But it's not. And so uh, Reuben uh, shared with us last week from, from Genesis chapter 29 where it says Rachel loved, uh, sorry, Jacob loved Rachel more than he loved Leah. And so within the, the messiness of polygamy, you have the messiness of favoritism as Jacob continues the sin of a previous generation. And so, of course, what does that do is it creates the messiness of rejection, doesn't it? And so where Reuben finished last week is with, with the birth of the first four children. So what we're going to do is we're going to build a family tree today to try and get our heads around all of the kids and wives and everything else that are going to become part of the story. I don't know, can you read the words at the back there in the pink? Yeah, kind of. Some of you need to go to Specsavers, but that's okay. So up here is the first four children that are born to Jacob uh, with Leah. But as you hear these words and the words, the names of the children carry so much meaning in this particular narrative, the names are meant to give an indication of what's going on in the storyline. And as you hear the, the names of the children that Leah will name, these first four sons, you, you hear some of the, the rejection and the brokenheartedness of her heart. So her oldest son was named what? Reuben. Did he make a big deal of that last week or what? Oh, I tell you. We'll get, up, we'll get back at him later on with that, by the way. But anyway, the first one is called Reuben, whose name means he sees. Yahweh sees because Leah says, Yahweh has seen the state I'm in that I'm not loved. And then she names the next one Simeon, which means he hears. Yahweh has heard my cry. And the next, the next one is called Levi, which means attached, and it's a prayer. May my, the heart of my husband now be attached to me. And then finally, she names her fourth son, Judah, which means praise Yahweh. But in the first three names in particular, you're hearing the heartache and the brokenness of this woman. So we have this messy, 
mixed up family already with the messiness of polygamy and the messiness of favoritism and the messiness of rejection. Meanwhile, while Leah is popping out babies left, right, and center, as we saw on the video, Rachel, of course, is struggling with infertility. Just like her mother-in-law, Rebecca, just like her grandmother-in-law, Sarah, she is struggling to have children. The irony of all this is that Leah, the unloved wife, is having kid after kid after kid, and the woman who is deeply loved by her husband is struggling to bear children. And so we read this as we now pick up the story in Genesis chapter 30, verse 1. We read, when Rachel saw that she was not bearing Jacob any children, she became jealous of her sister. I want to suggest that this is the first time that Rachel has ever felt this emotion. She's gone through life as the favored child. Ever since they were little girls, she was the cute one. She was the beautiful one. She was the one who got all the attention. Her older sister kind of grew up in the, in the shadow of this gorgeous woman. And so for all of her life, she's been the one who's been noticed. She's been the one who's number one. She's been the one with the spotlight. And for the first time in her life, she feels second best. She's got the silver medal. And she's feeling the pressure of what's going on with her sister. And so within the messiness of polygamy and favoritism and rejection is now the messiness of jealousy and the messiness of struggle and competition and rivalry. And so she, she continues, she says to Jacob uh, in the middle of verse one, so she said to him, give me children or I'll die. To which Jacob becomes angry. In verse two, he says, am I in the place of God who has kept you from having children? He's like, hello, I've got four. It's not my problem. And suddenly now there's the messiness of blame, isn't there? You go back to the Garden of Eden when sin first enters the human story. And the first thing that Adam and Eve will do after they have sinned and hidden from God, the next thing they do is they blame each other. It's your fault. And that's what's happening in this story. But Rachel has a plan. Listen to this. Brilliant. Verse 3. Then she said, here's Bilhah, my servant. Sleep with her so that she can bear children for me and I can build a family through her. Oh, this is brilliant, friends. This is great. If your marriage, your polygamous marriage is not already a mess, just bring another wife in. Honey, meet Bilhah. Now, this is common practice in the ancient world. In, in couples who were struggling with infertility, and archaeologists have shown us from a number of the cultures around uh, this area at this point in time, this is how they practice uh, responding to this. This is ancient surrogacy. So the, the primary wife had the right to bring a servant girl in as a secondary wife, a concubine, in order to have children which she would then adopt. And that's exactly what Rachel is doing. It's common practice. It's wisdom. If Rachel had been hanging around talking to some of the other married women of her day and talking about the struggle of infertility, her sister's up 4-0 at this point, and they would have said, girl, just bring a secondary wife in. And Rachel goes, oh, what? no, why didn't I think of that? And it's utter foolishness biblically. It's the wisdom of the day, but it's complete foolishness biblically. And so she brings in the secondary wife, Bilhah, who, by the way, was probably a teenage serving girl. Now, we don't hear her voice. We don't know her point of view, but you have to feel for her, don't you? She's a pawn in this very sick and messed up family. But anyway, that's what Rachel suggests. Verse 4, as we continue the story, so she gave him, this is Rachel, gave to Jacob her servant Bilhah as a wife. And Jacob slept with her, and she became pregnant and bore him a son. By the way, can I just say, Jacob is utterly pathetic in this story. He is absolutely pathetic. He will end up, when we finally get to the end of the series, he will become a man who is pursuing God. But at this point, he is pathetic. The only words that Jacob speaks in the entire narrative we're looking at today is verse 2, where he gets angry with Rachel and blames her. Apart from that, he is silent. He does nothing. He doesn't pray. He doesn't walk by faith. He doesn't trust God. 
He doesn't turn to Rachel and she says, hey, take my servant girl as a wife. He doesn't say to her, you know what? Grandma Sarah tried this back a few chapters and it really made a, a complete mess. So maybe we shouldn't do that, honey. No, he says, okay. In fact, I don't, want to, I don't want to offend you today. But Jacob is nothing more than a stud bull in this story. Honestly, the only thing Jacob does in this story is he impregnates his wives. That's it. That's his whole role. So Rachel comes along and says, hey, here's Bilhah. And he goes, oh, okay. Idiot. Anyway, this, this, so, so Bilhah becomes pregnant. Verse 6, then Rachel said, now listen to Rachel's words. God has vindicated me and he's listened to my plea and he's given me a son. God's blessed me by introducing a third wife into this marriage. Eh. But because of that, she named him Dan. Dan means vindicated or victory. And then verse 7, Bilhah conceived again and bore Jacob a second son. And Rachel said, I have had a great struggle with my sister and I have won. So she named him Naphtali. So as we continue to build the family tree, we now have two more sons uh, being born to the third wife, Bilhah. And again, don't miss their names. So when Leah is naming her first sons, her names are to indicate to us the brokenness of rejection and the mess that that creates in this marriage. Well, now, now Rachel is adopting these two kids and she names them Dan and Naphtali, struggle and victory. And so what that's telling us is giving us a window into the messiness of the competition and the rivalry that's happening within this family. And sad, everyone knows. Everyone in the whole neighborhood knows. Because whenever they call these little boys in for, for dinner, whenever they yell at them to stop climbing that tree or hurting that animal, Naphtali, come, Dad, stop that. All of the neighbors are hearing, struggle, victory. Guess what a mess our family is. But at least Rachel has adopted two children for two. Meanwhile, Leah is looking on. And Leah has stopped having children after the four. And some scholars suggest it might have just been a season where, where she was unable to conceive, but there are other scholars, and here's where I would go, who suggest that probably Jacob has now stopped even visiting her tent. Jacob's done with her. He's not interested. He never loved her. He's, he's not that excited by her. And so he, he's not even interested. He's got the wife that he loves and this beautiful new wife that he you know, thinks is pretty hot, and Leah's just old Leah. And so Leah's looking on going, I've stopped having kids. Jacob doesn't visit my tent anymore. But you know what? That's what Rachel did. Oh, I've got an idea. Honey, meet Zilpa. And so Leah's looking at Rachel and going, well, if Rachel can bring us another wife into the marriage, why can't I? So now we have wife number four. And now you have to buy a larger photo frame to get the whole family photo in. And what happens is that Jacob will now sleep with Zilpah, and two more kids come from that, Gad and Asher. Now their names, their names mean lucky and happy. So if you think about the meaning of the names and what they're telling us about the story, Leah names her first kids and, and, and it reveals the broken heartedness and, and, the, and the struggle. Uh, then uh, Rachel names her two adopted children and it's indicating this rivalry and competition. And now Leah, Leah now adopts her two kids, these two kids, and she names them Lucky and Happy because I'm now up six too. And I want to suggest for the first time in the story, I think there's an air of superiority and arrogance stirring in the heart of Leah. For the first time, she's ahead of her sister and she's enjoying it. And then, as if it wasn't messy enough, the story takes a really weird turn in verse 14. We don't have time to read the whole thing, but you can read this later for your own entertainment if you want. But what happens in verse 14 is that the oldest son, Reuben, he's probably now four, five, six years old, and he's out one day in the fields, and he sees some beautiful plants that he thinks mum would really love. And so he pulls them up, and he brings them home to his mother, Leah. And they're called mandrakes. 
Now, he would have had no idea as this little kid, but mandrakes were considered in the ancient world an aphrodisiac. Now, he wouldn't have known what that meant and wouldn't have been able to spell the word. But he brings these plants home to Leah, and, and he's brought these mandrakes, which were considered to be an aphrodisiac, but not only that, they were considered to be a very good herbal treatment for infertility. And Rachel spies her nephew with mandrakes. Now, the other three wives have all borne children to Jacob, but not Rachel. And Rachel eyes up the mandrakes. And she goes, I need those. That's what I need. So she says, hey, hey, Leah, could I have some of those mandrakes? And Leah responds, this is in the text, you've stolen my husband and now you want to steal my mandrakes. And so Rachel says, I'll tell you what, you, you give me some of the mandrakes and I'll send Jacob over to your tent tonight. <laughs> yeah, come on. Now, I don't want to gross you out because this is God's word, but this is horrendously messy. This is actually gross because Rachel is now pimping her husband to her sister. That's what's just happened, friends. But Rachel now has mandrakes. And Jacob spends a night with Leah, but then is back in Rachel's tent. And she's got the mandrakes, and guess what happens? Nothing. Instead, Leah falls pregnant again. And she has child number five, and then child number six, and then child number seven. So we read in verse 17, God listened to Leah, which, by the way, in the middle of all of this mess, Leah's praying. He listened to Leah, and she became pregnant, and she bore Jacob a fifth son, and Leah said, I get Leah's theology. God's rewarded me for giving my servant to my husband. Eh, no. But he has, he has blessed you. So she named him reward, Issachar. And then she conceived again, and she bore Jacob a sixth son. And then Leah said, God has presented me with this precious gift. This time my husband will treat me with honor because I've borne him a sixth son. And so she named him Honor, Zebulun. And then, sometime later, she gave birth to a daughter and named her Dinah. Now, we don't know if Dinah was the only daughter born amidst all of these boys, or whether there were other daughters born, but, but they're not named because they're not as significant to the story. Dinah will be later on in the narrative. Um, but either way, Dinah is the only name here of a child that isn't given the meaning, but Dinah, scholars will tell us Dinah's name is actually the feminine version of Dan, which meant what? Vindication, victory. And it's as though Leah is just putting a dagger into the heart of her sister and saying, no, no, I have the victory. Nine, two. And then finally, in response to all of that, finally, 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 the pregnancy test is positive for Rachel. And the story finishes with these words, then God remembered Rachel and he listened to her, which means what? She's praying in the middle of all of this. And he enabled her to conceive and she became pregnant and she gave birth to a son and said, God has taken away my disgrace. And she named him Joseph and said, may Yahweh add to me another son. Joseph means add another. It's a prayer. One more, God, please. One more. That's now, if you're keeping count, 12 kids. 11 sons, one little girl. And to understand what's happening here, you need to understand the time frame that Reuben unpacked last week, but we need to put all of this into the, the timeline. Jacob turned up in the homeland of his mother in the household of his uncle Laban, and he works seven years for Rachel, yeah? The end of that seven years, he marries thinking it's Rachel, it's actually Leah. They have the wedding celebration that lasts the whole week. He then immediately marries Rachel. So they mar he marries the two wives within one week of each other. But then he has to work another seven years for Rachel's hand. At the end of the seven years is the next story that Pastor Louis will be back with next week, which begins in verse 31 of Genesis 30, where Jacob will now say to Laban, it's time for me to go home. 
So what that means, friends, is that the story we have just looked at all happens in that second seven-year time period. Here we go. Twelve kids in seven years. Yeah, wow. Rochelle and I have three boys. We had them in four and a half years. Our oldest, Harrison, was four and a half when our youngest, Jaden, was born. That was insane. Three boys under five. That was hard work until we could get one of them off to school. But that's nothing next to Jacob. Twelve kids in seven years. Well, actually, even if Leah got pregnant with Reuben on the wedding night, it's closer to six. Six years, 12 kids. Can you imagine the chaos and the mess and the noise and the toys and the nappies and the food and the fights and the arguments and the chaos of this family? But that's not the worst of it. Because the mess of the situation is not these beautiful babies and toddlers walking around and learning to talk and everything else. The mess of this is the polygamy and the competition and the favoritism and the rejection and the blame and the inferiority and the superiority and the human foolishness and the rivalry and everything mixed in here. And the tragedy of this mess is that this will continue to the next generation. In fact, to be honest, friends, I've thought long and hard, and if you have got another example you want to share with me later, go for it. But in my mind, I cannot think of a more dysfunctional family in the entire story of Scripture than this right here. This is a mess. This is the very definition of dysfunction. And the mess and the dysfunction and the chaos and the favoritism and the superiority and the rivalry just gets passed down one generation to the next. So so Reuben, for example, you know that your pastor was so proud of, the oldest. Do you know what he's going to do when he grows up? He has an affair with wife number three. Remind your pastor of that next time you see him. (laughs) Then the next two kids, Simeon and Levi, when they've all grown up, their little kid sister Dinah is going to be raped by a Canaanite prince. So you know what they do? They resort to deception. Who did they learn that from? Dad. They resort to deception to trick that prince and all of the men in that town to be circumcised so they can go in and slaughter the whole lot. Judah, the fourth one, he will disappear from home when he's growing up. He will go live among the Canaanites and essentially be a Canaanite and live out the sexual ethics that he's seen in his dad. And when all of them are growing up, Rachel will actually have her prayer answered, Lord, give me another son, but she will die in childbirth to her last son, Benjamin, who will complete the 12 sons. But while Benjamin's still a little boy, when Rachel dies, Jacob will take the favoritism tag of his favorite wife, and he will just put that onto the oldest son of this woman, Joseph. And if you were part of our collective series a couple of years ago in the story of Joseph, you will know that the favorite tag now rests on Joseph and all of his brothers will turn against him. He he doesn't get even get the support of his two adoptive brothers. No, no. The favoritism, the superiority, the competition, the rivalry just goes on from one generation to the next in this messed up, broken, screwed up family of faith. Paul will write these words when we get to the New Testament, the book of Galatians. Paul will write, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. A man reaps what he sows. A woman reaps what she sows. And what we see in this story, this tragic story, is the messiness and the brokenness and the sin. There will be far-reaching consequences for the choices and decisions that Jacob and these women will make. But friends, this isn't only a story of messiness. I want to suggest today this is also a story of grace. This is a story of grace. Best-selling author Max Licato writes these words, God answers the mess of life with one word, grace. Grace. Because do you know what happens with this family? The most messy, the most dysfunctional, the most screwed up family in the entire story of Scripture. Do you know what happens? This family becomes a nation called Israel. This family is the family that God is going to use to bless the world. 
These 12 kids whose names mean struggle and victory and lucky and attached, they're going to give their names to the 12 tribes of Israel. And one day, centuries from this moment, this mess is going to give the Messiah who will be born through them that we will celebrate in a few weeks' time. Friends, the big idea of the story is not actually the mess. The big idea of the story is this. Our mess never trumps God's grace. Our mess never trumps God's grace. And I'm not using the word trumps there to talk about the newly elected president of the U.S. I actually wrote this before the election result was known, although some of that's a mess. But anyway, I've taken the word trump here from card games. You ever played 500 or euchre? The idea is that the trump suit will always defeat any other suit, no matter the value of those cards that are laid. Friends, life is not a card game, but I will tell you this. The mess we make of our lives can never trump the grace of God. God's grace always trumps what we have done. It doesn't mean we don't live with the consequences of our actions. It doesn't mean that we don't sometimes still reap what we sow. But friends, God's grace will always win out. And in this messy story of this dysfunctional family, you get this horrendous mess, this chaos. And out of it comes a nation. Out of it comes 12 tribes. Out of it comes Messiah himself. And you know what? You get to the very end of the story of Scripture you get to the new heavens and the new earth that Donovan reminded us about as he led us in worship today, where we will sing that new song. And you get to the very end of the Bible, and you have this picture of the new heavens and the new earth together, God coming and living with us forever and ever and ever. And in the middle of Revelation 21, there is this beautiful vision of the eternal city of God and new Jerusalem coming out of heaven and settling on earth to be our dwelling place. And here's what it says in Revelation 21. He took, carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high. And he showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. And it shone with the glory of God. And its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a, a jasper clear as crystal. And it had a great and high wall with 12 gates and 12 angels at the gates. And on the gates were written the names of who? Sorry? <laughs> See, that's God, friends. God takes the most messy, dysfunctional, screwed up family in the whole story of the Bible. And he takes the names of kids that mean struggle, vindication, happy. And he emblazons the eternal city with those names as a testament forever and ever and ever that it doesn't matter what mess you and I make of our lives. It doesn't matter how many mistakes we have made. It doesn't matter how badly we have sinned. His grace, when we turn to him, his grace will always triumph over the mess we have made of our lives. Our mess never trumps God's grace. And friends, here's the reality today. We're all a mess. We're all a mess. You're a mess. I'm a mess. I'm not this mess. But I'm a mess, friends. And there's so much I look back on my life, decisions made, choices taken, that I wish I could have back. A few weeks ago, my wife and I were walking our dog uh, one morning, as we do each day. We're talking about the fact that in three weeks from now, our oldest son is getting married. And we were talking about how quickly those parenting years have gone. I mean, I feel like I'm in my mid-30s, you know? <laughs> Don't laugh. He run at Grace City laughed as well. <laughs> and those parenting years have just gone. And suddenly, we have a 25-year-old son, and he's about to get married to a beautiful woman. 
But we were walking with Arlo, our dog, and we were talking about the parenting years and how quickly they've gone. And I, I don't know which one of us it was, but one of us just said, yeah, as I look back, though, I wish, I wish we'd done that different. And then the other one of us chimed in, and I wish we'd done that. And we ended up having this really depressing conversation, friends, <laughs> about all of our regrets as parents. Now, we're not bad parents. Our kids aren't totally screwed up. In fact, most people would look at our family and say it's pretty functional and that we're pretty good parents. But here's the truth. When we take an honest stock take, I have lots of regrets as a parent. I have lots of regrets as a pastor. So many decisions made and counsel offered and actions taken, I wish I could do that over. I have regrets as a friend where there's brokenness or there's hurt or there's been words said, I'd love to take those back. I have regrets as a husband. Times I'd wish I'd loved Rochelle better than I have. Regrets as a follower of Jesus, of moments not taken and mistakes made. And you're the same, aren't you? When we're honest, friends, when we're really brutally honest, this isn't our mess, but my word, we have a mess. <laughs> Choices that have been made, decisions taken, priorities that have been messed up, angry words that have been said, angry moments we'd love to get back. Some of us look back at, at stupid financial decisions. Some of us look back at sexual promiscuity. Some, us, some of us look back at decisions we made that we'd love to have again. And some of us, some of us still carry the guilt and the shame and the remorse for stuff we've never actually shared with another human being. And the message today, friends, is that our mess never trumps God's grace. Our mess never trumps God's grace. Jesus stepped into our mess. Jesus lived a life without our mess. And then he gathered up our mess and he took it to the cross. And he died for our brokenness and our failure and our sin and our mistakes and he rose again to say, it is done. It is finished. And it doesn't mean there may not be consequences for our foolishness and our sin and our wrongdoing. But his grace always wins, friend. When we turn to him, his grace always triumphs. And this story of mess in the scriptures reminds us, and it will remind us forever and ever and ever, in the eternal city, whenever you walk through a gate called struggle, whenever you enter through a gate that says he hears, it's going to be a reminder for all of us that he is the God of grace and his grace always triumphs. So as we finish today, we're going to take communion together. This beautiful celebration that Jesus gave us as a reminder of what he has done in overcoming our mess. So there's tables at the front, as you'll be aware if you're a regular, tables at the back. And I want to invite us to come. And as we do today, here's what I want to invite you to do. I want to invite you to think about some of your biggest regrets. I want to invite you to think about maybe the messiest mess that you've got. And I want to invite you to come to these communion tables and in a sense, in your mind, I want to invite you to bring your mess and lay it down and take bread and juice as a symbol of what Jesus has done with your mess. And then I invite you to walk back to your seat in the freedom that Jesus brings every one of us through his grace. So let's celebrate him today the one who by his grace has overcome our mess. Lord Jesus, thank you for this incredible story. Thank you that you 
as you inspired your word through your spirit, you never sugarcoated the stories of people. You just allowed the brokenness to be there, which is so encouraging for us, Lord, because if everyone was a hero and everyone did stuff right, we wouldn't relate to that. But we relate to the mess. We relate to the brokenness. We relate to the regrets. We relate to the shame. Lord, this morning in this moment of quiet, I want to pray for anyone who is just heavy laden with regret. Maybe they've come and, and they're just exploring what it means to follow you. I pray that they will get a glimpse of your grace today. Well, Lord, I especially want to pray for anyone today who is your follower, your child, who's walked with you and yet they still carry the guilt and the shame and the regret of past mistakes. Lord, help us lay those down. Help us to really understand your grace. Help us to realize, as Reuben reminded us last week, that we are loved in Christ. And we're not loved because we deserve it. We're loved in Jesus. So I just pray that you would help us come today to communion to bring our mess, to bring our brokenness, to bring our sin and to lay it down and to celebrate what you have done for us, Jesus, in your grace. And we thank you for it in your beautiful name. Amen.